Chapter 16 The big stag moved through the wood amongst shining leaves. He stepped through thickets and across dingles where the half-moon scattered an uncertain light. The stag seemed to surge forward, cleaving the waters of the night. His head held upright like the carved prow of some ancient ship of war. The wild music was sounding in him, growing louder every moment. It was the familiar music of joy, but now there were different notes rising in it. Sudden growling barbaric chords that swelled and died away without reason. Jim felt the delights of riding the stag more keenly than ever, perhaps because he knew it was the last time he could afford to taste its pleasures. If he kept his word to Mary, there could be no more midnight rides, and he knew he must not go back on that promise. There were too many intervals of blackness now, too many times when night and fog filled his mind. There were forces stirring in him which made common cause with the blood-driven will of the stag, and the two together threatened to take all control away from him. Sometimes he was tempted to let that happen. So far his moments of subjection to the stag had been against his will, but the idea of surrendering had become more and more attractive. Why not let go? Why not lapse and merge? Till he could share the deepest pleasure of the stag, the most profound stronghold of its being. That began to present itself more and more as the natural fulfilment of all that had taken place so far between him and the creature. Jim felt the pull of the temptation very strongly, more so tonight than ever before. The body of the stag cried out to him, and his own flesh answered with an equal tenderness. That was why he knew he must break free, though he tried to hold his knowledge at a distance, tried to shield it from the stag by not thinking the idea in words nor even in images. All the same, the stag seemed to sense the threat to their alliance, and, as if to answer, it unlocked the pleasures and delights of its nature as never before. Jim saw that the stag would not let him go easily. It would struggle to hold him, and in what ways it would fight, he could no longer be sure because the stag itself was changing. It was physically different now. Its neck was swelling, the ruff of fur where there was growing more coarse, and in the depth of the throat strange baying sounds were struggling to be born. Barbaric noises like the discords that had invaded the wild music of their rides. He had one all important aim tonight. He wanted this meeting with Mary to express all that he felt for her. He wanted to carry her into far places on this ride. He must somehow set the seal unshakably on their love, bind the two of them in such a way that the bond could never be broken even when they went back, as they must after tonight, into the dull, treacherous, everyday world. The stag reached the hedge at the boundary of Rolls Meadow, and leapt carelessly into the gap it had made on past visits, touching its hooves down lightly on the top of the bank as it soared through. There was a jolt and a sickening drag on the stag's leg, then a rope snaked and tangled amongst his antlers. He was held, his body twisted back on itself, his head wrenched to one side by the loop. Fury and panic broke out in him. For a moment he was no more than pain and quivering blackness. His body twisted, jerking on the rope, then sagged with impotence against and self-disgust. He began to hate blindly. He raged against his body because it would not work for him any longer. He kicked and struggled against the enemy that had dared strike him down. A deep shaft of fear and emptiness had opened in the stag, and from the bottom of it came those same fierce barbaric noises, breaking like bubbles in the tunnel of his throat before they reached the air. Jim was falling down the shaft, but even as he fell he struggled to regain some calm. He knew he must fight against this descent into chaos. He must try to hold back the darkness that was rolling over him like a storm, threatening to sweep him away. He struggled, and he won a space of quiet. Even in its frenzy, the stag heard and turned to him for help. He hung suspended in the darkness, floating on a frail raft of thought. What had happened? His brain laboured, still threatened by the blackness, vertigo, the resumption of the fall. There was a thing twisted round his foreleg, a rope. There was also a loop tangled in his antlers, a noose. 
As soon as he understood what had happened, he began to feel more confident. A snare had been set in the rack over the hedge. He was lucky the noose had not gone round the neck properly. If he could hold down the stag's panic, he might still get free. He found the lower rope and forced it apart with a hoof until he could work his leg free. Then he was back on all fours, but was still held by the head. He could see the stout rope going up to the branch of a beech tree. He dragged on the noose, but it only tightened, a slipknot. He looked for a stump of wood in the hedge, a lopped branch, something like that, and in the end he found what he wanted. Slowly and clumsily he worked the stump into the noose. It took him several attempts, but at last he got the stump in such a position that by dragging on the rope he could use it to force the knot back and loosen the grip of the noose. Once the noose slackened, he partially disentangled his antlers until at last he stood clear, shaking with the anger he had been obliged to hold down during his escape. He was furious and ashamed. Who was it that had dared humiliate him? Who had broken the laws which protected him on Exmoor? Who had tried to lay hands on his freedom? Who was it that wanted him trust and helpless again? The fierce noises rumbled in his throat. He knew the answer. A mean spirit had done it. A man who cared more for profit than for the stag or the ritual that should attend his death. A money-grabbing rogue who was afraid in case his profitable campers from Wolverhampton should be put out. A man who settled rows of caravans and tents on good barley land. A man who tormented animals as a trade. A man who would shut any breathing soul into a battery cage for profit. The sort of man who, because his imagination was withered at the root, would smugly lay waste the earth and debase its creatures, robbing them of the nobility that nature had planted in them all, either because he failed to see it, or else because he thought it of no account when set against the prophet. The noise rose up in the stag's throat and burst from his lips this time. A hollow booming sh shoot the air and echoed in the far woods, the declaration of a very ancient and lordly wrath. This man, this creature, had slunk out to lay a trap for him, and next morning, no doubt, he would have crept along at dawn to finish off his victim, throttling him in the noose, or twisting on his neck till it broke, and then he would have reported that the black stag had got caught up in his newly wired fence, and had killed itself, struggling to break free. That must have been his plan. He would never have dared admit that he had deliberately laid a trap for the king's stag on Exmoor, not if he wished people round about to speak to him again. He had plotted in secret to trick the hunt and bring down the stag. Jim knew the assassin's name. It could only be Mr. Rawl. Well, he would pay for his treachery. The booming roar broke from the stag again, and Jim forgot about Mary in his desire to revenge himself upon her father. The black stag trotted up to the long, windowless shed, and, with a flick of his grey antler, shot back the bolt which held the door fast. A moment later, and the stag was inside the building, prowling amongst the lines of cages. Jim suffered the stag's nausea at being here, the disgust which made him twist his nostrils and continually shake his head. The atmosphere was stale loaded with the stink of dusty feathers and chicken droppings, a warm, stagnant pool of air. There was a dim, reddish-brown burning continually in the place, day and night, had been abolished here. Thousands upon thousands of fowls were crammed in the cages. They made low noises, or stood in complete vacancy, their little eyes blank as bed beads. This multitude of starved lives gave off its own smell, a sour reek of desperation. Somewhere within the shrouded blackness of the fowls lay the claims of instincts never brought into play. Their bodies mourned for, for losses the nature of which they could not guess at. Even the most lowly creatures are endowed with the dignity of needs and take a proper joy in their satisfaction. Let those who cripple nature out of greed beware, thought Jim. Somewhere, sometime, they are going to have to pay for it. This pronouncement took on a loftiness and severity that were not his own. His voice seemed more than human. To deny nature, that was the worst sin, the sin against life, the sin against the old ones, the unco unforgivable sin. Pity moved in him for the fowls. He went and let down the fronts of their cages, but faced with freedom, the poor brutes cowered back into the safety of the only place they'd ever known. 
He was angered by their fearfulness. It seemed like a threat to him, and fighting spirit of the stag took over. He drove at them in a blind passion, lunging at the cages with his antlers, pitching them down on the ground. Seeing the terrified hens scuttle into corners, squawking with fear, they hated him for setting them free, and he went on with his work of liberation amidst a growing hubbub. He was almost stifled by the thick air, and stung to madness by the shrieks of the complaining hens. Their panic-stricken scuttling and wing-flapping, he took hold of himself again, looked haughtily at the little litter of smashed boxes, and then deliberately drove a flock of hens before him out through the open door into the vastness of the night. He could hear stirrings over to his left in the camper's field. The beam of a torch shone against canvas. A square of light appeared high up in the dark shadow of the farmhouse. Mr. Rawl must be, a be out of his bed. Let him wait, thought Jim. There was no more to come. The stag trusted him. It did not try to stop him entering the campus field, despite the rank odours of man's sweat that hung there. The harness, the he harnessed the new ferocity of the stag to his purposes, and with a bellowing roar he plunged in amongst the tents, ripping canvas and tearing out the guy ropes. The night filled with the shouts of alarm. Ghostly figures in pyjamas ran out of his way. Under the canvas of two collapsed tents, a huge wrestling match seemed to be going on. Women screamed and held their hands to their mouths at the sight of him. People herded together, huddling in droves. He was reminded of the hens. He roared again, bellowing his contempt of them and their kind. He knew where they had come from and what had been done to them. Rage shook him at the memory of Wolverhampton, the endless mazes of streets, the houses like cages, that world of hunch, hutches and batteries and stunted lives. No, he roared again in the wordless voice of the stag. He rattled the plywood of caravans and stove in their flimsy sides. Hutches, he bellowed, hutches, plunging at the lines of caravans, trying to destroy a world. Gabbling voices told him of a change in affairs. By the light of the moon, he could see the crowd clustering around a new arrival. It was Mr. Rawl, with a black rod at his shoulder, a metal rod on which the moonlight glinted. The stag kicked up his heels and cantered away, leaping the near hedge and crossing the meadow to the rack that had nearly proved his downfall. Behind him ran a figure with a gun. Mary had been awake, waiting, but the noises entered only dimly at first into the expectancy of her dream. The squawking fowls and the yelling voices were not what she was waiting for. They were only hindrances to the arrival of her master. Then she heard her father's heavy boots go clattering down the stairs, heard him cursing as he went, and her dream was broken. She dressed hurriedly and ran after him. By the time she reached the campus field, the stag had gone, and so had her father in pursuit of him. Just then she heard the report of a gun over in the meadow, and fought away through the crowds of bewildered people to follow her father. She was sobbing and pleading as she ran, muttering frantic words. Across the meadow by the far hedge, she could make out a dim figure stooping over something. Dear God, no, she prayed. She was in such a state of dread that she could hardly bring herself to cross the field. She had heard the campers talking about the stag. She had heard the gun go off. What else could her father be so, so busy with, hunched over in the shadow of the hedge? She came up on him silently, terrified of what she might find. Her father seemed to be dragging a length of rope out of the hedge. She was baffled by his actions and by the scrambling, furtive way in which he was carrying them out. Next, her father climbed up on the bank and began to work at a rope knotted round the branch of a beech tree growing there. "'You didn't shoot him, then,' she said. Her father started and almost lost his balance. "Eh?" Hey? he said angrily. "'Who's that?' "'Oh, it's you, Mary. I heard the gun. I fired to drive him off, fired over his head. Ah, relief surged through her. She looked at him curiously. "'What are you doing?' "'Never you mind, my girl.' Mr. Rawl stepped down from the bank with a loop of rope in his hands. Suddenly Mary understood. You set us trap. She whispered, shocked. I tried to block the rack, her father mumbled. That's all I did. No, said Mary. That's a snare. You set a snare. What if I did, said her father sourly. Do I have to account for you for it? That brute, he's mad. Have you seen what he's done? The damage he's got to be destroyed. Mary stared at him blankly. 
her father leant towards her and pushed his face into hers. Say nothing about this, he growled. Understand? Nothing to nobody. Mary nodded and turned her back on him. Now that her fear was over, all she could think of was that there would be no last ride. Her sense of loss was sharp, but at least the stag had got away. So much damage, said Mary. Did you have to do all that to him? He tried to kill me, said Jim. They were sprawled on a deep bed of ferns in the corner of Mrs. Perkins' cottage. The hot scent of crushed fronds hung all around them. Jim had made up the bed that morning. He did not quite know why, but he had felt restless and depressed, and the idea of a bed of ferns had been a consolation to him. He enjoyed lying in it. Not you, said Mary, a stag. Jim grunted. He was not appeased. A rogue stag, he said. He was only trying to stop up the rack. No, said Jim, he meant to get me. Not you, Jim, Mary persisted, not you. Jim lay moodily chewing on a stalk of grass. He felt a deep disdain for Mr. Rawl, which did not bother, he but did not bother to hide. He could have been killed, whispered Mary, stroking his hair. Not me, he said dryly, the stag. But what would happen if, Jim turned hot brown eyes on her, I don't know. You did promise, she whispered, whispered timidly. Jim chewed on the grass blade and would not answer. You promised you'd stop. A slow flush spread over Jim's face. His breath struck her cheek, sweet with the tang of grass, as the words were wretched from him. What if I can't? Can't stop, she asked in desperation. Do you mean that? There was a silence. Do you mean it? No, he said grudgingly. I can, but it's so hard, Mary. He did not want her to know any more about the strength of the stag's demands, nor of the sudden plunges into darkness that were overtaking him now, not only when he was with the stag, but also sometimes when he was in his own body. Only this morning, at the breakfast table, he had lapsed into a state of blank contentment, a dim sleep amongst with widely bushes, and when he came back to himself, he saw by the clock on the mantel that half an hour had gone by. He must have been a strange sight, staring blankly across the breakfast table for all that time, but Mr. and Mrs. Yendall seemed not to have noticed. At least they made no comment. They were always very considerate about his lapses, very ready to put it down any odd behaviour to his condition. Only when he said, Good Lord, I must have been dreaming, did Mrs. Yendall offer him a remark. I reckon you were miles away, she said, pointing out of the window towards the purple flank of Dunkery. Mr. Yendel looked at him with grave attention, as if eager to receive any word he might have brought back. Jim felt puzzled by the way in which they passed over his strange behaviour. He knew his mother would have been very upset, and would have dragged him off straight away to the doctor's, but the Yendel seemed to take it all for granted as if in some way they had come to expect it of him. Yet at the same time they certainly put themselves out a great deal for him. They treated him like a king. Ideas on the subject flickered and died in his head. He became restless, trying to think about their tolerance and the growing difference they paid him. It was then that he had jumped up, leaving his breakfast unfinished, and gone to make his bed of ferns in a corner of the parlour at Mrs. Perkins' old cottage. Mr. and Mrs. Yendall did not try to stop him leaving. They let him do exactly as he liked. "'You know what it is tomorrow,' said Mary slowly. He knew very well. The last meet. They're all talking about it. They say they mean to shift heaven and earth to get the black stag. I've heard them. Everybody's keeping a lookout. All the farmers, the harbourers, are making a special effort. They swear they'll take him tomorrow. Jim looked at her uneasily. No, you mustn't, cried Mary, guessing what was in his thoughts. Stay clear of him this time, Jim. Don't try to move him. She saw him brooding, and her arms went round his neck. I couldn't bear it if anything were to happen. He nodded gloomily. I have to go. You know that. Have to go, his voice was deep, guttural, to the hunt. My father's insisting on it. He's going himself, and Edward's coming home especially. I promised ages ago that I'd go to the last meet with him, and he hasn't forgotten. He keeps writing and phoning, pestering me, and I can't get out of it. Jim grunted. There was a deep, painful commotion inside him. The stag was bowing in the hollows of his body. He fended it off. Besides, said Mary, I have to be there. I have to know. I have to, Jim. Yes, he said wearily. I suppose you do.
Promise me, darling, that you won't go near. Promise that you'll finish with it from now on. I've promised that already. He could hardly mouth the words. Thank you, said Mary, and kissed him on the lips. A long, fervent kiss, but he found it hard to respond. They lay there for a while longer, but things were not the same between them that day. After a time, they admitted defeat and left, both of them bruised in spirit at the loss that had been inflicted on them.